Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host, and uh, we've got quite a show today, folks, and hopefully you can tune in your recorders and the like and call your neighbors in and whatever. We're going to probably talk to one of, the, one of the topics here within the Portland metro area that's very, very important, but even from a national perspective, but because it's, a, it's probably the largest urban educational facility within the state, I thought it's very, very important that um, we spend some time on education with, with all of the issues uh, centering around uh, the efforts that are supposedly made by the governor in regards to trying to get more monies, if you will, for the schools and things of that nature. And But you know, they talk about the idea of getting more money for the schools, but, but what's the definition of the schools and, and where are the benefits, if you will? Because the bottom line, in all due respect, is about the kids and getting them educated enough so they can go out into the world, if you will so that they can make it and, and we have many areas in there that uh, that we can talk to but what we're going to do today is that we've got three people here that are, that are going to be part of the discussion that I, as far as I'm concerned um, I've known them for, for, um, for some time but besides that they've got the expertise and they've got the exposure uh, and uh, you'll see this as we go along with this because what I'm going to do I'm going to ask each of each of them to give a little background about who they are and and what, what, what role they have played in the education system within within the state of Oregon for whatever for whatever reason along that particular line. And then we're going to just get into the discussion and, and we're going to specifically focus on Portland Public Schools. Okay? With that, why don't we just start off with it by introducing the guest right off the bat. we got uh, Steve Buell. Steve Buell, who happens, by the way, who happens to also be seated on the, uh, just recently elected to the school board here at Portland Public Schools. Welcome, Steve. And we got Don, Donna Maxey. Uh, uh, the, the, I, I won't say Maxi Clan, but you know, me, a well-known group of folks, and I've been knowing them for quite some time. Know more about the parents more than the, the young folks, but you know, she's young folks, right? Okay. Right. right. But, okay, okay. But, but it's kind of neat, and she's she's a very interesting person. In fact, I'm going to make it a point that she she does a program called Race Talks, uniting to break the chains of racism, an opportunity for dialogue, which is good. And in fact, what we're going to do, we're going to be taking advantage of her educational background. She's a she's a retired school teacher. Yes. And so we're going to we're going to be taking advantage of that. But I'm going to. We want to do a piece just on this piece, right. and I want to spend some time with you on that because I think it's very, very important, especially now. Okay, good. And then we have I'm gonna call him Dr. Grace, Dr. Mike, uh, Michael Grace, Chappie Grace. Uh, uh, in fact, I, I, we go back a ways too. But and his dad was a very prominent person, both his dad and mom, and whatever that matter. And you probably know Kevin. And that's another friend of his, very, another educator in his own rights. And, and I, I think I want to do that interview because in all due respect, with his, uh, his so-called door shade now today is that he's actually, he's actually uh, with the kids, but they're at another level. You know, he's in another marketing piece. Yeah. Let's put it that way. Ken Berry. Yeah, 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 Ken. Yeah, Ken, Ken, Ken Berry. And, and so I want to make sure that we, uh, we spend some time with that. So, so those, those are my guests, folks. And so, so please sit back and relax and... Um, and we'll just uh, leave the driving to these folks right here. I'm just going to, sort of, as a lay person, just ask these lay questions, if you will, as we can. And, and I, I got to thank um, um, the, all three of them, for that matter, that um, they've given me some sample, some sample questions that, that, they, that focus it and keeps me on on course, if you will. And I think I like that idea. So why don't we start around the deal? And Steve, why don't you just come and give us a little background in terms of Steve Buell? Uh, I was a 40-year school teacher. I'm kind of wearing three hats. Yeah. The second one is I was one of the founders of Oregon Save Our Schools, and we've been fighting down at the state uh, Oregon Educational Investment Board for the last two years, trying to get them to do some sensible things that actually are more that more directly help children. And recently, I was elected to the Portland School Board. Kind of snuck and up. And you were on the board before, prior I to. I was on the board in 1979 to 1983. Right. right where we did quite a bit of work. Okay. All right. Donna? What do you um, want to say? I'm Donna Maxey, and my dream as a child was to be an elementary school teacher, and I achieved that green dream. I taught for uh, 35 years plus, and I've worked with everyone from preschoolers through adults, um, and I'm now retired from Portland Public Schools, and I decided to change my focus from working with children to working with adults and so I started the program you uh, race talks okay. and Portland public schools I mean what, what, what were you teaching oh I've taught you? a number of places I taught in California oh. in rural California I've taught yeah. in rural urban inner city suburban and um, 
you pick a you pick a setting. I've worked there. Really. So. So it takes. There was some time here in the Portland metropolitan area. I've taught. I taught in Portland for fifteen years. Oh really? Okay. But the rest of the time was taught in California. Okay. Good. Michael. Well, I began teaching in 1969 in uh, Washington D.C. So I'm in the 40-year club also, and um, I, I taught in Portland for. 26 years and then moved to California and uh, delivered an education package there for the National Council on Educating Black Children uh, called Infusing Responsibility for Intellectual and Scholastic Excellence. And um, But locally, I, I returned to Portland a couple years ago and we've continued over all that time to produce the Martin Luther King tribute, which many people are aware of through our local nonprofit, World Arts Foundation Incorporated. And, and I'm active with the local NAACP and particularly the Coalition of Black Men who, mm -hmm. who got a calendar yes, for everybody yes, uh, yes. today. My interest is in uh, addressing the question of how do we elevate and accelerate the achievement of those with the greatest need. Mm -hmm. And among those with the greatest need are African American males. Mm -hmm. Good, good, good. Okay, that's your <laughs> intro, folks. Um, any, anybody else want to add something to whatever? Okay, good. Okay, why don't we just start it off? I'll, I'll throw these questions out right, right at the beginning. What are the biggest concerns for parents and families in public education? And when you when you respond to the question, by the way, if there's anything that you want to respond even beyond that, as it as it talks to that particular question, just throw it in there. Okay, we're having a conversation. Okay, right. Donna, what, what, how about you? you? Want to start off with that thing? Well, I think parents want their children to be loved. Okay. Um, they want their children to be accepted and to be given the skills that they need to be successful in life as adults. We all want our children to do better than we did. And, um, and, it's, and one of the things that I always say as a teacher is that I have the second most important job in the world. The first most important is being a parent. And I don't take that job lightly. Um, I think that parents are concerned that their children will be treated fairly. And um, and pushed and given the skills that they need. I know when I talk to people, I can tell who got a good education and who didn't. I was speaking to someone recently and, and uh, he was quite excited that I knew that instead of saying, um, I did an adverb and said, mm -hmm. you, you'd not, you, not that you did good, but you did well, or mm -hmm. that, you know, you were walking slowly, and he goes, <laughs> wow, you know, you, you know that. And, and it's really unfortunate, but this is not the kind of education that children are getting now, and I don't see children being prepared for life. I see them being prepared for taking a test. Okay. And parents want their kids to be able to pass that test because life is a test. As I like to tell my kids all the time, life is a game, and in order to win a game, you have to know the rules. And if you don't know the rules, you can't win the game. And unfortunately in life, a lot of the game's rules are unwritten. And what, what parents want, since parents, uh, pe particularly in lower socioeconomic families, is they are looking to the schools to teach their kids those rules that they themselves don't necessarily know or did not learn well. And so that we get back to my original hypothesis that parents want their kids to be loved. Okay. Is that parents want the teachers, which I try to do, is to treat the kids in my classroom like I would treat my own child. Okay. Steve, from a historical standpoint, how is that? Is that right? Oh, yeah, she's, bringing, bringing yeah, she's re I think she's right on. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're moving away from that in the schools now. And the testing is terrible. It is. Uh, way overemphasized in Oregon and it's having a real negative effect in the schools. Mm -hmm. In a lot of ways we need to rein it in and get back to getting kids a good solid well-rounded education where they can go out and take that education and use it in the world. Mm -hmm. It's pretty hard to use your testing ability in the world. I mean they do take tests, good thing to know, but it's not the only thing you need to know. Okay. Right. Well, I want to uh, go from the global down to the specific and uh, just talk about the idea of parents and families. Um, I often uh, will remind uh, an audience that if we look at our community only in terms of the problems that we have, we have a problem community, mm -hmm. but if we look at our, our schools and look at our community in terms of the, the achievements, the obstacles that have already been overcome, the strategies that have already worked, and, and the things that are going well right now, we have something that we can draw from and uh, help us get out of uh, complaining only. The idea of uh, parents and family is important because oftentimes we talk about parents and parent involvement, but uh, about 45% of the kids in uh, inner city schools don't live with their parents. 
they live with their grandparents or foster parents or other uh, family members. It's not just a, a mom and dad situation all the time. So when we talk about how do we interact with uh, parents and family, then we're embracing a larger uh, group. And what those parents and family who have come to understand just how important education <coughs> is, uh, what they want and what they have in mind, uh, what they would like to see are the kind of expectations that are embedded in, in loving the children mm -hmm. and the kind of high expectations that they should have and uh, from my vantage point what I'm looking for as a parent and as a grandparent now is looking for leadership at the school building level because I think that's the the mechanics that that elevates and can accelerate the achievement of the kids. You know uh, in regards to the family let me throw this on the table you know let's talk about the definition of the family say years back and then bringing it up to date you hear things like for instance you got a one person type of person, family if you will person but babies having babies things of that nature do you think that the makeup of the family the definition of the family has changed drastically has it changed let's throw it on the table well it it's changed in some of the ways that uh, it's structured but family is that loving group that takes responsibility for that child and it's not always a, a two-parent family or it's not always uh, the traditional family I remember and you all may know this woman her name was she's a retired educator named B Anderson B Anderson was a teacher she's deceased now but uh, she had two sons all the years that I knew she grew raised them up and both of them became Eagle Scouts and mm -hmm. both of them became professionals and there was no man in the picture but there was a strong woman and and one who understood uh, how to get her own children to engage the public school system and the advantages that could accrue from that. So it isn't always, that's not the only uh, problem that we have, um, but the family structure uh, has shifted. Oh, there are more, um, and I have some, some percentages on the percentage of kids in Oregon that have single parent family, that live in a single parent, parent mm -hmm. household, mm -hmm. or where just one income is driving the household, and of course there's a correlation between income and achievement. But uh, it's changed, but not necessarily for the worst. Um, it, it's changed in the expectations of the family and the ways in which schools might engage the parents and family. I don't know how strong our PTA or PTSA is uh, now, or the church in the way that it can uh, prepare parents or fortify the relationship at uh, home and school. Uh, and uh, the Coalition of Black Men in Portland this year, which is morphing into a chapter of the 100 Black Men of America, has as its priority as far as the education committee is mm -hmm. concerned, interacting with parents and family and giving them tools to help make the home a better learning environment. One of the mm -hmm. things that I, Michael intimated something that I think was very important when we were growing up and I felt like, um, I jokingly always say I went to all the best ghetto schools here in Portland, mm -hmm. but I think I got an excellent education. Um, my parents made sure that the things that I didn't get in school that I got at home and not only at home, but the community was a huge part of our education. And it wasn't just, I think the difference is that when we were kids, we didn't have just one set of parents. Every adult was our parent. And I knew Michael peripherally, um, knew his cousin Gre uh, Jeffrey much better. But if I was out of line, Michael's mother had every right to say something to me. And before I got home, my parents already knew what had occurred. So it was truly a community raising a child. And I think that's where the difference is, is that we do not have that community involvement that we had before. There have always been single parent families. Mm -hmm. There have always been grandparents raising mm -hmm. children. I think the difference is the... Um, we had, and at the time that we were children, we had a lot of men in our community. Mm -hmm. And by, I mean, and I make a distinction between a man and a male. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are many males in the community. They are not always proceeding as adult men mm -hmm. in, in helping our children develop. And, um, and I think that children, Michael uh, intimated about the church, and, you know, people want to argue about religion. I think that the purpose of religion is to help give us rules for, for getting along in society and getting along with each other. And what was different when we were kids, and I'm sure Steve this is true with you and with you Bruce, is that there were 
other adults, we learn not only respect at school, but we mm. learned it in church also. And we learn from the community how to respect each other. And you were taught to respect not only the adults, but the other kids and yourself. And I think that um, it's really important. Um, one of the, I had my administrative credential and I served in a quasi-administrative position as the um, student management specialist at a middle school. And that's like the dean of discipline. Mm -hmm. And I remember a child coming into my office saying that he thought he was crazy. And I said, well, why do you think you're crazy? He says, well, I hear voices. So, well, what do the voices tell you to do? Well, one voice is telling me to do the right thing, and another voice is telling me to do the wrong thing. So, well, what does that voice sound like that's telling you to do the right thing? And he goes, well, it sounds like my mom. And I said, well, what does that other voice sound like? Well, you know, it sounds kind of like, I don't know, it's, it's this horrible, mean, terrible voice that's, you know, sneaky and telling me to do things. And I said, well, that's your conscience. You know, you watch the cartoons and there's an angel on one shoulder and a devil on the other one. That's what that is. Mm -hmm. So listen to that mother voice, mm -hmm. the one that's telling you the right thing to do. But because he had not gone to church, he did not understand that he wasn't crazy, mm -hmm. that it was his conscience mm -hmm. talking to him. But, but there's God a spirit. sense of family flight now within, within our arena. I mean, today, you know, for instance, they, they're talking about that. In fact, I, I picked up an editorial there in the Oregonian, and the, idea, the, the whole idea is, hey, we gotta keep these families here, whether it be middle-income middle families, there. There's a flight, if you will, or whatever. But there's a concern about the definition of the family as it exists. I mean, when, you, when you talk about the idea, we hear there's been this uh, the thing before about it takes a village to raise a child, you know what I mean? A whole village. Yeah, yeah, a whole village to raise a child. And there's been talking, but, but you don't hear that situation again, what you're talking about now. You don't see that pattern anymore. Steve, what do you think? You're the new member on the school board. and how do you, First off, let me ask you how, you, how do you feel so far? You, you're the new guy on the block? Pretty frustrating so far. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty frustrating. The system doesn't work very well, I don't think. Mm. So we'll see how that goes. I think they you kind of covered the family stuff. I'm yes, okay. Pretty much so I have now. to ask you a question. Since you were on the school board before, is there a difference between how it operated before and how it's operating now? Well, I've only been on about a month, and but there's a huge difference. Uh, and the main difference really was that the board now seems to be kind of, it doesn't operate very well openly. Hmm. Everything's kind of back in the back rooms, the decisions and stuff. And I think it used to operate pretty openly. And the, be the best government operates openly. So you can see they deliberate in public, you make decisions in public, you can hold people accountable for their decisions. But if you're making those kind of off the, uh, out of the way, uh, it's very hard to do that. And, and that's been, I mean, I kind of would like to change that. And I think it plays a lot in why we haven't been able to some degree to to solve some of the problems mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. they have had that have been around for a long time mm -hmm. and have sometimes gotten worse. And, and well, so I, I pride myself yeah, on so working on the solutions side of the equation. And what I'm finding, or have found over a period of time, is that uh, yeah. Oh, there's your alarm. Turn those off. Yeah, get those off. No problem. What I found over a period of time is that it's complex. It's very for those of us who like to believe that we've got a silver bullet or that we've got a strategy that that will alleviate some of the questions, some of the problems we may have, but. Um, it's a complex matter, and that's what you find at the policymaking level. Is that there are a yeah. lot of layers, there are a lot of interests, and there are uh, are a lot of um, nuances that have to be navigated and negotiated in order to arrive at a solution that serves mm -hmm. really everybody, which is what your job is, and uh, to serve everyone, and then also then to drill down so that you have those uh, populations, whether it's special education or immigrant population or those that are on the lowest tier of achievement, how do you deliver solutions for them as well? It works better if the system works, however. Mm -hmm. You have a better chance. You're now, you, yes, it's still complicated, but you have a lot better chance if the government is doing a good job itself and running well. I mean, we can see it every day and, you know, take mm -hmm. the Senate, United States Senate. I mean, the government needs to be set up so it has a chance of being successful for everybody and so maybe, uh, it's one of my early things i hadn't planned to have okay. to work on that but i'm okay can i go to work on it a little okay maybe maybe it's a time maybe it's timely now to bring up the issue of government you know the fact of the matter is that our government president governor if you will governor uh, 
kid topper mm -hmm. brought up the issue of how he now he basically took the superintendent's job and brought it in, in the in the state in the state capital right so to speak if you will and i based on the, the fact that all these issues that are out there meaning that hey we, we were having problems with reference to uh, uh things like graduation and this that and the other so, so i look at it as sort of like a super board if you will and he's the guy in charge and took, took people from the school portland public school like julie brim edwards like Saxon, you got kicked her in on them, this, that, and the other, and just recently, just well, initially hired the, the, this new person, if you will. I'd, I'd call him the administrator, Mr. Cruz. And then all of a sudden, you know, all of a sudden, you got another issue. Now Cruz is not here anymore, but now they're looking at possibly trying to bring somebody inside. They got someone temporarily uh, positioning that piece. But again, I, I'm just throwing it out there right now, since we, <coughs> before we get into these other issues aspect of it, maybe it's timely right now aspect of it. What do you think about this whole issue about the the Cruz situation and the makeup that the government put together? That that uh, well, it's it's not it's not that. working. It's uh, not working. It's not working for kids. It. It works pretty well for the consultants, and it works pretty well for people who are making money off of education. It doesn't work very well for the children in our state, and it's it's really been a failure so far, a huge failure. It's made things worse, not better, in place after place after place. This is why I try to focus on the decisions and the structure and the activity at the school building level. I can give you a two examples. One that I've observed. Mm -hmm. uh, one is at Roosevelt High School uh, with the leadership of Charlene Williams. If you ever visit that school and you talk to her, she is uh, she has some resources that she has some command over, but more she's gained the respect and generated a kind of communication among her staff where they have confidence, confidence in her and have permission to to explore and develop uh, the strategies that are going to work for that particular population. The population that's at Roosevelt is a little different than the population that you might find at Lincoln High. And the other is uh, at higher education, the most encouraging thing that I've read uh, recently is Dr. John Watsky at the University of Portland is mm -hmm. having their graduate students who are working on their dissertation now uh, are going to track what works in public education. Mm -hmm. So now we have a partnership between higher education that's responsible for training teachers in the future and the public schools uh, who is a rich source, who are a rich source of data and, and examples and uh, perhaps we can find some things that are replicable uh, at the school building level uh, that doesn't necessarily bypass the politics or bypass the policy making but uh, to me where the rubber hits the road and why I've invested my time and energy working directly with the children and directly with the parents and family and now with uh, the preparation for teachers whether it's through the Portland teacher program and there are some good examples around mm -hmm. ways that we can improve education regardless of the coming or going of uh, a Rudy Crew or a Czar of Education. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. In the, that you really education is really what takes place in the classroom and what takes place in the school. Mm -hmm. And what the the Oregon plan does is make it harder to deal with that. And and that's how they get in the way. They make it harder for teachers to really teach well. They make it harder for principals to make those adjustments within their building. If you're, all your time has to be spent with the Common Core curriculum, which is not necessarily helpful, then it takes all the time away that you should be spending with children, that you should be spending with making sure your building is working better. And, and absolutely right. I have, I, I, I hopefully that Portland, University of Portland project will work. It depends on what, to re, what they decide to research. Right now, uh, hu huge amounts of research are just pretty much wasted. So uh, I, I wanted to address this from the mm -hmm. classroom teacher yeah, point right, of view. Right, right. I've always felt that there was politics involved in education. Mm -hmm. Education is one of the most political uh, tools in this country. And I don't know if most people know, but uh, the school bill is a political issue. The school bill. The school bill. Um, I taught at a school in a um, well-to-do suburb here in Portland, and there were no bells. And I questioned that. Why are there no bells? And then I started doing a little research, and I found out that the bells were originally instituted to teach children to be ready to work in the factory. So hmm. it was kind of Pavlov's dog, you know, you hear hmm. the bell, you go, you, 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 you know to go. Right. And uh, whereas hmm. when you're raising children that are going to be the managers and the owners, you don't want them to be trained with the bell. Hmm. So there was a bell to start the, the day, but there were no other bells during that day. 
Um, so politics has always been, and, and that's a class issue, and that's something we don't talk about in this country, is class. And that's an issue that uh, supersedes ethnicity, money, mm -hmm. it's a mm -hmm. class issue. So um, as a teacher, and, and I understand what you're saying about the testing and the politics and all of this, I've, there's always been that, mm -hmm. and I've always been frustrated about it, and so I've always taken the attitude that when I close that door, I'm God, mm -hmm. and I am responsible for those children. When I started teaching, I would, they talked about local parenti, mm -hmm. the, that the teacher was the local parent, the parent at the location. But now it's the school, the principal is the loco parenti, so the teacher doesn't have the same connection with mm -hmm. the child. No matter what the responsibility was that I was given to, what curriculum I was forced to teach, and I do say forced because there were times that I was forced, I still felt it was my responsibility to teach another side of that curriculum, to teach outside of that mm -hmm. information. And unless teachers educate themselves to know that there are other sides uh, that kids need to know, other critical thinking skills that they need to have, mm -hmm. then they will continue to teach the basics, you know, the core curriculum, and be frustrated. But I credit my parents with having taught me that there are some other things that need to be taught. So When did you notice the big change in that whole issue, the idea of the out of the, the taking that responsibility and whatever out of the classroom and i.e. the principal aspect of it. When, when did that happen? Any any ideas? Moves? I want to say in the late 70s, early 80s, I started mm -hmm. seeing a change happen. Um, but I really saw in the 90s mm -hmm. the the testing taking over as a major major issue. And I see that as being again that's a very subtle class issue. Every time you, you r bring these tests along and say students need to have these particular skills, then once those skills are acquired, the kids are, ar are arriving at that, then they raise the bar. Mm -hmm. And they raise the bar, and they raise the bar. So now we have over 50% of our kids not graduating from high school. Many kids went to school for sports, for music, for art, for shop. They went to school, home ec, they went mm -hmm. to school for those skills. Now we don't have those any longer. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and, and they stayed to get the math and the critical literature skills and the writing skills because they were using the other things that mm -hmm. kept them there. A and I feel like, you know, we've really lost one of the important things is teaching children to learn to get along with each other, teaching social skills. Uh, there was a book written some years ago, and I can't remember the author's name, called um, Everything I Need to Know I Learn in Kindergarten. And it's really true. But we're not teaching it in kindergarten anymore. Okay. We're too busy trying to teach them how to read and pass the test. Steve, you're shaking your head when you say Up and down. Tonight, I'm shaking tonight, it up yeah. and down. Look, yeah, she's right, it, no, she's right on. Right on? She's right on. Absolutely. The problem is that the pressure is pushed from the top, really, the top-down mandates, whether it's Washington, D.C., which are built around corporate reform stuff, mm -hmm. where corporations ha have an agenda, and that agenda gets pushed through the government down into the school classroom. She's right on. Huh? We're, and it's that particular agenda forces us in the wrong directions. And yes, there's a lot of teachers who do shut their door, and often should, and shut their door, and, and do teach around that. I mean, that's out there. But it's difficult. It shouldn't be difficult to do that. We should be encouraging that. Uh, the best teachers I've ever known, that's what they did. The best principals that I've known, that's what they encouraged. And we're going in the opposite direction now, and it's, a re it's weakening education all over this country, because it's not just now it's not just what goes on in your school, it's what goes on in the next door school and the other schools in the district and the other schools in the state and the other schools in the country. We, this 47 states adopted the Common Core Curriculum. Okay, is it good or bad, but 47 states adopted it. I mean, it's pretty pervasive, whether you think it's good or bad, it's very pervasive. But another thing that happened that's handicapping teachers, and the reason I retired, I had planned to work for another five years. Hmm. But in the last four years of my teaching, I taught seven different grade levels. And what was, about, what was that time? That time period? What was that? Um, I just retired two years ago. Two years ago. Okay. So, um, 
that meant, and then on top of that, I'm teaching different grade levels, but I couldn't get... And you read them the riot act, you have a little cheer or an afro.